Thanks for joining us for this uh, panel on women in politics, which is brought to you by the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research as part of our Think and Drink series. So called because in the before times it took place in a venue with beverages of all sorts. And maybe one day will again. Um, this, this panel is also co-sponsored by our friends in gender and women's studies as part of our Women's History Month programming. Um, so I'm just going to uh, introduce the panelists and I guess also myself as well. Hello, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me. I'm uh, Melissa Morris. I'm a historian uh, here at the University of Wyoming. Um, so the way this works for those of you who are new to our Think and Drink series is that um, for those of you in the audience, we heartily welcome your questions, uh, which you can type in the chat. I will open with a few questions that are directed to each of our panelists individually to get us started, and then we'll turn to questions from all of you. Uh, and I'm going to proceed kind of chronologically in my opening questions. But before I do that, I do want to give just an introduction to each of our panelists, which will uh, occur in the, in the order in which they appear on your program, which is to say in the uh, little graphic we make, which is to say alphabetical. Our first guest is Dr. Kimberly Hamlin, who is a professor of history and global and intercultural studies at Miami University, which as an alum, I feel compelled to tell you is in Ohio. Her work is focused upon histories of women's rights, women's political activism, and the cultural construction of ideas about gender and sex. She is author of the recently released Free Thinker, there in the background, uh, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner. Spoiler alert, truly an extraordinary life. Um, she is also the, the author of Eve to Evolution, Darwin, Science, and Women's Rights in Gilded Age America, as well as a number of other articles and other pieces. Dr. Tracy Owens Patton is professor of communication and journalism at the University of Wyoming. And she has authored a number of articles on topics involving the interdependence among race, gender, and power, and how those issues interrelate culturally and rhetorically in education, media, memory, myth, and speeches. She is the co-author of Gender, Whiteness, and Power in Rodeo, breaking away from the ties of sexism and racism. And she's also working on a second book involving race, memory, rejection in World War II. Dr. Nancy Small is assistant professor of English at the University of Wyoming and is also the director of first year writing. And she is author of the forthcoming book, Paradox and Agency in Transnational Spaces, White US American Women in Qatar. And her research focuses on how everyday storytelling constructs our shared life worlds. And relevant to our discussion tonight, Dr. Small and Dr. Patton are the joint authors of Making Waves, Maxine Waters and her challenge to black women's erasure and white hegemony, which appears in the newly released Routledge Handbook of Communication and Gender. And finally, we have joining us as a panelist, Dr. Rosemary Zagari, who is the university professor of history at George Mason University. Her research focuses on early America, a field in which she has published a number of books and articles. Um, her book project she's working on right now is called Liberty and Oppression, Thomas Law and the Making of Empire in Colonial British India and the Early American Republic. Most pertinent to our talk this evening, she is also the lead historian on the National Endowment for the Humanities funded project Mapping Early American Elections. And she is the author of Revolutionary Backlash, Women in Politics, in the early American Republic. So a huge welcome and sincere thank you to all of you for joining us tonight, panelists and audience alike. Um, we have, yeah, a lot of attendees so far, so great. Welcome to all of you. Um, and again, as I said, I'm gonna just open with a few questions directed to each of you in what I think of as like your kind of chronological scope. So I'll start with um, you, Dr. Zagari. Um, at the founding of the United States, what role were women expected to play with respect to politics and, and what kind of opportunities were open to them with respect to civic life? Okay, well, first I need to take my imaginary drink <laughs> and to thank you uh, for having me. And while I dislike most things about Zoom, I do love the ability to talk with you all 
in a place very far away from me, uh, where I'm in Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. right now, to you in Wyoming and elsewhere. So anyway, thank you. Um, so uh, basically, you know, the standard understanding of the role of women at the time of the American Revolution was that women um, had no role, that they were politically invisible. Their, their God-ordained roles were to be wives and mothers and largely to, you know, be subordinate to their husbands, at least in theory. We know in practice that's not true, but that was the theory. But um, we, we see, even before the revolution, signs that women are starting to engage more and to be begin to enter the public and political sphere. And so, you know, one of the reasons I should emphasize that women were thought to be invisible is because of the legal constraints of the time. Um, a, a doctrine called coverture said that women um, um, couldn't, married women, I should say, couldn't own property. And because voting in Anglo-America was based on property, uh, married women, most adult women, in other words, uh, weren't allowed to vote. And again, along with this, the sort of embedded norms of patriarchy, they were presumed to be silent politically. But as I say, that was starting to change in the decades right before the American Revolution. So on that, on that note, what ways uh, after the revolution in the early republic do you see uh, that changing for women? How, how do their, you know, how do, what possibilities open up or, or close in that period? Well, um, I, I need to start again before the revolution because um, as protests against Great Britain mounted, uh, you know, accusations that Britain was, the British Parliament was taxing Americans without their consent, that Brit, the British King was appearing to be a monarch, I mean, not just a monarch, but a tyrant. Um, uh, as these protests mounted, male political leaders tried to devise strategies for opposing these British uh, depredations. And among the strategies they devised were boycotts against British goods. And the male political leaders began to realize that for these boycotts, that is a, a refusal to buy the goods that Britain was selling on the international market, a complete trade embargo, in other words, um, women needed to participate as consumers. Women bought an enormous number of goods from tea to, to feathers to, uh, cashmere shawls to beautiful textiles from Britain, tea sets, et cetera. And so women uh, were asked to support men in these um, boycotts against Great Britain. And from that, it expanded to include other kinds of protests. And women began to take it on themselves to protest against merchants who uh, violated the boycott. Uh, women began to um, find a voice and you start to see a number of educated elite women start to write uh, about political matters. So one of the leading authors of the time was a Boston woman, Massachusetts woman named Mercy Otis Warren, who wrote uh, treatises and poems and plays uh, in opposition to Great Britain and then encouraging revolution. But there were other women as well, um, including the African-American woman, Phyllis Wheatley, who during the American Revolution um, wrote a poem to George Washington, praising him and celebrating the American Revolution. But other elite women, uh, Esther DeBert Reed and Judah Sargent Murray joined in this chorus. And of course, everyone's heard of Abigail Adams and she actually was not a published author, but these other women were. So women were finding their voice. Women were starting to engage politically. Um, men had sort of invited them, but then women, uh, at least middling to upper class women in particular, started to sort of um, read more about politics, um, be more interested in politics and participate in these informal ways in politics. And there actually came to be a name for women who did this. They, they started to be called female politicians. 
And that term did not mean women who ran for public office, but it was regularly used, sometimes critically and sometimes approvingly, to refer to women who were interested in politics, informed about politics, and again, who saw themselves part of the political public sphere. Cool, thank you. I love that, yeah, female politicians as a right. you know, category. Um, I want to turn next to you, Dr. Hamlin, um, and kind of pick up in perhaps the in mid 19th century and onward. Um, in your work, you know, what are some examples of women who are working outside the channels of formal power, meaning not that, you know, they can't run for office, perhaps, but they have other ways to do that. Um, and thinking, you know, especially of the subject of your your new book, Helen Hamilton Gardner what possibilities were open for a woman like her and other women like her to agitate for change? Great question. Um, and I also want to make sure our audience knows I'm going to skip over a few decades. So um, Rosemary got us up to 1810s, 1820s. And my current research picks up more like 1870s, 1880s. So we'll have to have another think and drink um, <laughs> about the importance of the Civil War, Reconstruction Amendments, abolition, and the early women's rights movement. Um, or maybe that'll come up in the Q&A. But the woman whose biography I just wrote, whose name is Helen Hamilton Gardner, she transforms herself from a fallen woman, meaning she had sex outside of marriage and everyone found out about it, um, in the 1870s to the suffragist lead negotiator in Congress who converted President Wilson to the cause and successfully negotiated passage of the 19th Amendment. She dies as the highest ranking woman in federal government. So within her trajectory of fallen woman 1876 to highest ranking woman 1920, we see a lot of changes. Now, of course, she kept her fallen woman status a secret her whole life. And I feel conflicted about outing it um, in my book, since she worked so hard to keep it a secret. But I really think that the sexual double standard is what motivated Gardner to enter reform. And by thinking about her life and following her around um, for so many years, I really came to see how that motivated so many women to enter public life. So for example, some of the first um, women's organizations, 1830s, 1840s, were female moral reform societies. And what they wanted to reform was prostitution, not so much focusing on the prostitutes, but making it so their husbands, their sons, their brothers did not frequent the prostitutes. And I want to um, delve in there just for a second to tell you how HHG, Helen Hamilton Gardner, as I call her for short, how HHG learned politics. So. <clears> HHG <throat> entered public life through the free thought lecture circuit in the 1880s. And she goes from there to write about other, other reforms, but she really finds her passion in raising the age of sexual consent for girls. So it may surprise you to know that in 1890, the age at which a girl could, was considered legally capable of consenting to sex with a grown man was 12 or younger in 38 states. In Delaware, it was seven. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union had been inspired by the British movement to raise the age and had been working on this issue in the 1880s, 1890s. And at first they had sort of believed this lie that women were told that, oh, men legislate for you. You guys don't need the vote. Your husbands are taking care of it for you. Your fathers are protecting you. But when these Christian temperance ladies go to try to raise the age of consent, they realize, what a lie that is. It's hard, it's impossible for them to gain access. So HHG steps in and she starts using fiction. She writes novels and short stories to raise public awareness of this issue and to really change the tenor of debates about so-called fallen women. So by 1895, um, she had she and her colleagues had succeeded in raising the age of sexual consent for girls. In many of the states they tried to at least 14 or 16, except for in the South. There's a lot of parallels between age of consent and suffrage and what states were willing to do what. And another big takeaway here, this will be the, my last point on this and then we can go to the other speakers, but the takeaway message here is that this really is where not only HHG learned politics, how to lobby, um, she went state by state by state as she would later do for the 19th amendment, 
but also the importance of women having a vote and a role in politics. So the only states that raised the age of sexual consent all the way to 18 were the states in which women had at least partial suffrage, Wyoming, Kansas, and Colorado. And here's your fun fact uh, for the evening. The very first woman to propose a piece of legislation in the state legislature is uh, Representative Carrie Holly from Colorado. She, Colorado enfranchised women in 1893. She's one of three elected to the state legislature in 1894, introduces the very first piece of legislation proposed by a woman. What is it? You already know, raising the age of sexual consent for girls. So this is what proves to women, not only do they need the vote, but a role in politics to protect their bodies and to really secure the link between bodily autonomy and political autonomy. Thank you. And I, I really like that idea of using literature, something that a lot of other women of the time did. I think I she's described in your book is that what the Harriet Beecher Stowe of fallen women and you can yes. really see the the power of of literature in that context for women cool um yeah I'll move um next to um Dr. Patton and um I'd like to ask you just kind of moving on to more recent times or whatever that is um what sort of rhetorical moves do women in politics make, um, perhaps looking at, you know, Maxine Waters in particular, but perhaps other female politicians, female politicians in a perhaps different, different context as well. Great, thank you so much. And I will split some of my time with, with Dr. Small, with Nancy, just because we, uh, co we collaborated on the Maxine Waters piece. And so we will play off each other quite well. So I'll just get us started and then, you know, just feel free to tag in there, Dr. Small. So that way, you know, I don't take up all of the time, but I think that the, the timeline is perfect, not just because of the time, but because of the question about rhetorical moves. Because if I'm going to look at VIP, VIPOC populations, for example, I'll hone in on African American or Black American populations and people, but really you see scholars and orators using all of the different kinds of persuasion out there in order to appeal to a wide variety of audiences. So we have novels, we already mentioned Phyllis Wheatley, there's poetry, there's storytelling, and then we have the very persuasive oral communication. And it's from the oral communication where I think that we, we see Black peoples take off from 1619 and some of the earliest recorded speeches by Black people were 1787 forward. And I think that's where people like Maxine Waters, she stands on their shoulders. I would be remiss, and I think we'd all be remiss if we didn't even mention Frederick Douglass, who's one of the first out men who was a feminist and was a very much an advocate in the first wave of women's movement. But in order to answer your question, I'd like to start with a quote. And one that comes to mind is by Octavia Butler, where she says, power is a tool. If you don't have it, you will be at someone's mercy. And I think any person of color who is in politics understands this. And one of the key things that people of color, in this case, Maxine Waters, since we're talking about Maxine, you have to understand your audience. And that's one of the things that rhetors do because rhetoric involves persuasion. And particularly if you're a person of color or a woman and or a woman, you have to tailor your message to a diverse audience since the default audience are white, wealthy, heterosexual men. And so from jump, women already have to think outside of the box. They have to think about who is the audience? What is the situation? Why am I speaking to this? What brought it about? And what do I want to do about it? And one of the key things that makes, if we're going to jump forward in time to someone like Maxine Waters, really relevant is that she's not just speaking at people and at the audience and at people who may be her fans, but she's saying, we all have an issue. We are a diverse group of people. 
but let's all work together. This is where she puts on her Auntie Maxine hat since she's known as Auntie Maxine. And she says, don't worry about the shenanigans and the distractions that the hegemonic hierarchy and power want to distract us with, but rather instead of grappling with the little crumbs that they might give us, that we have to work together on said issue, which is why one of the reasons why we wrote about her because she really uses and engages in feminism as well as womanism in really powerful and transformative ways, ways in which I don't see very many politicians, regardless of gender, be very successful and engaging in. I'm gonna pause here so that way Nancy can pop in. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Patton. Um, so my comments will complement um, Dr. Patton's. She, she really emphasized audience situations, bringing people together, Maxine Waters as a harmonizer. And I was thinking um, about this notion of rhetorical moves and what rhetorical moves are is ways to claim territories, which are like key issues, things that all politicians do. Um, but I think contemporary women politicians still have to claim and then reclaim certain kinds of spaces over and over. They can't like claim them and then move on from there. So uh, three kinds of spaces come to mind that um, build off of Dr. Patton's establishing of like audience situation and harmonizing. The first is contemporary women politicians like Maxine Waters have to create a space of ethos or trustworthiness from which to speak. So they even have to create the, bound, the boundaries on which people would listen to them. Um, so oftentimes like with Waters, this is built up through experiences. She has four decades and counting of experience in government, um, but she also builds this up through pr like her presence, her presence at events, her presence at situations, her presence in leadership kinds of situations. Um, and she hasn't resisted that label of auntie that uh, Dr. Patton mentioned. So she's present as an auntie to the people that listen to her. She also reinforces her ethos through kind of real talk or plain talk. She knows that time for sugarcoating is long past. So she, she has to create this space of ethos where the people that she's trying to get to ally with her will listen to her and kind of believe in what she's talking about. But she also has to create like moments in time and spaces from which to speak. What I'm thinking about here, especially with like government kinds of rhetoric is that there's such competitive communication. People talk over each other. We have mansplaining, which doesn't necessarily even have to happen from a man, but that kind of, I know better than you, let me stop your comments. People are also dismissed in the public sphere. And so those kind of things shut people out of their spaces. And I love Waters' response to Steve Mnuchin um, in one of the hearings that she was reclaiming her time that's a reclaiming of her space and her moment in which to speak. Another example would be when Elizabeth Warren refused to be quiet and Mitch McConnell said, well, I tried to get her to be quiet, but nevertheless, she persisted. That persistence is a constant reclaiming of space. So um, and one more thing, uh, and I'll just make a, a brief comment to close out. Um, I think Waters also creates by, space by working binaries. Um, she looks at um, the struggles of so many different kinds of people so um, women of color, but also women, white women, uh, people of different socioeconomic statuses, people of different gender identities, all different kinds of people who tend to be marginalized. So instead of having like a singular kind of constituency, she's trying to work the kind of both and constituency. And that's a kind of space to work the both and kind of slash rather than just working in either or. Um, I just, um, Tracy already mentioned building alliances um, I just want to mention that I love that Maxine Waters is like a singular icon, like she is very much her own distinct woman, but she's also known as a deal maker, even across the aisle. And sometimes that can like make her situation a little bit challenging because she's trying to please people in ways that she can't keep everyone happy. And I really respect that about her. Also, just thinking of another example of modern uh, rhetoricians in the public sphere, I'm thinking of the squad. Ocasio-Cortez, Omar, Presley, Tlaib, Bowman, and Bush, those, that alliance is key to their success as rhetors. So it's just different spaces I was thinking about for rhetorical moves. Thank you so much. So I wanna move now to some questions that um, anybody can, can address uh, as you see fit. And, and really this follows, I think, well upon what you were just talking about. 
Dr. Small, and I'm interested, and this has come up a little bit, but I want to talk about it more because um, uh, I think it's interesting to think about the avenues of political participation that like historically have been, as well as currently are available for women of color in enslaved women in an earlier period, poor women, what kinds of um, political participation do you see from those kinds of women and, and what, what kind of alternative avenues have those kinds of women created for a participation in civic life? Was that a question to us? That was a question to anyone who would like to address it. So what kinds of I mean, I guess you have somewhat addressed it right in your discussion of, of Maxine Waters, but um, if anyone else or including well, you. Can I, can I sort of turn the question a little bit around and respond to some of these comments about Maxine Waters just by historicizing it in terms of these women of the 18th century who were really, uh, if you want to put it this way, the trailblazers because, um, uh, th these women perceived themselves and were definitely perceived by men as transgressing into male territory. And um, they often faced, you know, a wall of hostility and there was nothing subtle about it. I mean, a lot of times today it's not subtle either, but um, these, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of Mercy Otis Warren, the author from Massachusetts and um, men actually sort of co-opted her because she was known to be a very talented writer. And they enlisted her to start writing poems and plays, you know, in opposition to Great Britain. And these were published in newspapers and, and as pamphlets. And um, she expressed some concern about, about venturing into what was understood to be male territory. And she said she's transgressing the line of her sex. And I mean, she's just very aware that she's doing it, but she's doing it because um, men are inviting her to. But what's interesting is that after the American Revolution, she gains a lot of confidence and she publishes in 1790 a book of poetry and plays. And um, she, she is much more assertive in that. And then she ultimately publishes in 1805, a history of the American Revolution. So I think, um, you know, there's not a straight line of development from these women, but I think, you know, you see them confronting these barriers that still exist uh, when women try to enter the public political sphere. And uh, one more comment on this, at this time, you know, in the 18th century, in 1776, the revolution and all that, I mean, they, her, Mercy Otis Warren's husband actually, um, commended her for her work for the revolution, saying that she had, and this is a quote, a masculine genius, a masculine genius. I mean, being political was conceptualized in masculine terms. And so it's a, it's a mindset that I know persisted through the 19th century and hard to believe, but it seems like in many cases, it's, we're still fighting against that today. If I may tag on to that just for one moment, just bringing up like Sojourner Truth would be a great example of that masculine body and mindset whenever Sojourner Truth makes her famous ain't I a woman or aren't I a woman speech. And at the end of the speech, people aren't believing that she's a man. She proves, you know, supposedly opening her blouse to show that, you know, she is a woman. But these are the, the struggles that Black women in this example have had from jump when it comes to being part of feminist movements where you're seen and invisible, invited to the table, but not wanted at the table at the same time. Because I'm thinking of people who often aren't included in that first wave of feminism, you know, like, you know, Sojourner Truth, Harry Tubman, we move forward with Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, you know, Josephine, St. Perry Ruffin, I mean, and on and on and on. And what they all have in common all the way even to Maxine Waters is this double bind that they have to navigate in their public appeal. Because even as women, if women are, from then are gonna say like, hey, we're women, we want the right to vote. 
black women were still not included to even exercise that right to vote until 1965. That's just 56 years ago. And so we see these ripple effects through all women who say, I'm claiming my space. I have my right to be here. You, from Vice President Kamala Harris to Maxine Waters, so on. So I think that that's a really good statement that you made because we see it continues and never stops. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Hamlin, I see you trying to come in. I just wanted to, whenever you were done, <laughs> I wanted to pick up on the role of race and racism in the suffrage movement and talk about some of the specific strategies that black women used um, to gain a political voice, to exert their political voice. Um, so I was gonna bring up Mary Church Terrell too, but I also wanted to bring up um, another historian, Martha Jones, whose new book, Vanguard, is so instructive on this and who reminds us that when we say women's suffrage, what we're basically saying is white women, right? So since we've just come off the suffrage centennial and since people might have that at you know top of mind in their discussion, I think it's important for all our attendees to keep in mind that just like uh, Dr. Patton said, the suffrage movement was a movement basically by and for white women that occasionally collaborated with black women, uh, but mostly excluded them. So women like Mary Church Terrell, and also um, I was gonna bring up Ida B. Wells too, just like you did, <laughs> um, to think about this, the places where they exerted political power. So for Mary Church Terrell, you know, in the black church, for example, coming up through leadership ranks in the black women's club movement, in the black church, and then as a founding member of the NAACP. And for Ida B. Wells, I wanted to talk about how brilliantly she used the black press and the international press, um, not just to press for women's rights, but also to, in her campaign to end lynching. So you really see, um, you know, two different sides of American history if you look at the white press compared to the black press. And you can even see this in the suffrage movement. So for example, if you look at the NAACP newspaper, The Crisis, you'll see a whole different version of the suffrage movement than you will if you look at the Women's Journal, which is the uh, publication of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of the black church the Black Women's Club movement, these early civil rights organizations, and the Black press in um, proving, proving a really uh, important ground for Black women uh, to begin to exercise political power. Um, I'd like to jump in with just a little um, comment, I guess, to complicate this narrative of women's suffrage. And that is that there is an episode beginning in 1776 and extending to 1807, when women actually were uh, eligible to vote in the state of New Jersey. So from the time of the revolution, when New Jersey wrote its uh, first constitution in 1776 until 1807, when the legislature stripped women of the vote in that, in that place. And it's a very uh, mysterious episode because we don't have a lot of, uh, records about why um, the New Jersey legislature did it, but it was presumably because um, they were applying the principles of the American Revolution, but with caveats. Um, since married women could not own property, uh, and since you had to own property in New Jersey to vote, the only women who could vote were women who owned a certain amount of property. But as far as we can tell, that did actually include um, African-American women if they owned uh, property. And it did actually also, the, the property qualification was race and gender neutral. So it also um, included African-American men. So uh, we know, and there's a wonderful exhibit that I'd like to give a shout out to at the Museum of the American Revolution called When Women Lost the Vote about women voting in New Jersey. And they have discovered poll lists that show that um, you know, the names of women who voted and actually the names of some African-American men. We have some anecdotal reports in newspapers about African-American women voting. But um, my, my point is really this, that it was always a very, very controversial episode, which is why it often gets excluded from this narrative of women's suffrage. Um, women actually didn't demand the vote. 
And then when they were stripped of the vote in uh, 1807, there were no mass protests. But um, uh, so it was very controversial. And, you know, the women were accused of being manly women. But, um, but the point is that women did vote and set this precedent for voting along with African Americans who met the, the suffrage qualification. But because it was qualified by the ownership of property, it was probably a relatively small number of people. Um, but what's interesting here too is that among the controversies is that uh, leading up to the stripping of the vote is that uh, women and African-Americans were blamed for massive fraud and uh, election, election corruption. Sound familiar? Um, and so this was the excuse used in 1807 to take away the vote from African-Americans and uh, women in, in 1807 in New Jersey. So it's a very odd episode, but I think that in some ways it reflects the continuing uh, prejudices, biases against women voting and, and the desire to scapegoat and exclude African-Americans and women. Um, now's the time I'll jump in from Rosemarie and also echo back a little bit to Kimberly. I'm going to do a little circling through time here. Um, so Rosemarie, your comments are making me think about how uh, Wyoming is often not recognized as the place that uh, the first uh, statewide or territory-wide at the time suffrage was offered to um, everyone, all, everyone except uh, Indigenous Americans. So we, you didn't, it wasn't by color or land ownership, but in 1869, the territory decided to grant uh, suffrage otherwise, except to the, the native folks. Um, and uh, the, the first person to vote, thinking about this idea of manly women was actually this little kind of Quakerish looking, very small elderly woman. Um, and she's like the antithesis of the women on the, the street corner with the signs, like the kind of pictures you have in your head from the suffragists around the Capitol, like those kind of activist women. Um, and when they wrote that her name was Louisa Ann Swain, we've got a bronze statue of her here in downtown Wyoming, downtown Laramie, excuse me. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the, a few days after the vote took place, she was recorded. It was a little controversial. There was a lady in Cheyenne who said she was first, but actually the Laramie newspaper claimed, like rectified that, said no, uh, Grandma Swain is what they called her, was first. And the description of her was how upstanding and what an upstanding member of society she was and how she was the perfect lady. So it was all this very much this kind of very feminine, like the, the idea of the keeper of like the civilized nature of, of who we are aspiring to be. And even the drunk men around the, the voting polls uh, stepped aside to let grandma Swain come in and cast her vote. Um, by the flip side, around the same time, 1869 is when suffrage was granted, 1870 is when she voted, and then she promptly returned back to Baltimore, so she was, she didn't stay in Wyoming, but there's a really fun clipping in the local newspaper, 1869-1870-ish, um, that call, that talk about the women's suffrage movement in California, and they refer to women who are in support of suffrage as pantalunatics, which just made me laugh, because we get back to this, like, insulting them by their gender and they wear pants and they must be crazy. It's like the pre, the pre, the precursor feminazi, right? I'm also thinking briefly about uh, Kimberly and your comments and thinking about how networks are where some of these activities take place, like whether they are newsletter kinds of networks, um, different kinds of organizations. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna bring it now into 2021. And I'm thinking about how social media is a site where this kind of political participation can take place now. And I'll just offer a quick anecdote. One place where I learned actually about, um, about women of color's feeling of displacement from the knitting and fiber community. So I'm a knitter and um, six, six months a year ago, I can't remember the exact time because COVID all blurs it together. There was a, a rift in the knitting community because uh, things like advertisements, patterns, uh, models of, of knitted items tended to be worn only by white women. And so people banded together, particularly on Instagram. And there was like a whole network of fiber artists of color on Instagram talking about these issues. So yes, it's yarn, knitting, crocheting, weaving, these kinds of things. But what they're really talking about 
is, is being excluded from the publics and excluded from the marketplace. And it was really fascinating for me to listen and kind of do some of my own homework. And then I, and then I had to join Instagram, which made me feel very old, but it was a great learning experience because I had the chance to tap into that public network. It wasn't a private network. So these networks of political participation might be overt, like on street corners, demonstrations, these kinds of very public activities. But there's an awful lot of this kind of stuff going on um, just under the surface if you can seek it out some. I, I feel like Pantalunatics would be a good like roller derby team name or, you know, an all female punk band. I, I feel yeah. like I, I, don't, I don't participate in those either of those, but like feel like yeah. that yeah. that's, it's a, it's that's the out there for someone. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, and, and if you are an audience member, please feel free and please do pose your questions. Um, the first one that I saw was this question about, um, is, there, is there something distinct about the participation of, of women in political life in the United States? And the example that the questioner was thinking of in particular was Angela Merkel, but we can think about that historically too. Um, do women in politics in the US have to do something differently, or is there something distinct about what they do over time? I've I've written um, a bunch of not scholarly articles, but like magazine articles about the history of women running for president. And one thing that some people say who study the comparisons between, you know, especially European countries in the US, why have there been so many European women prime ministers and so few, and no, not so few, 0.0, .0 um, female presidents. Um, and some things that people bring up is the, the example of a tradition of a queen that, you know, one, one role model we do not have in the US is a queen. We do not have a historical memory of a, you know, head commander in chief as a woman to draw on. I'm not advocating for a return to monarchy. I'm just pointing out that we don't have that as a historical precedent in our imagination. So, and as a historian, I think like all of my co-panelists about the importance of narratives and stories. And when all of our textbooks, our AP exams, our monuments, our schools, our streets, our federal holidays, our trust the white man in charge, that's what we imagine when we think of who should we vote for, right? So I think it's a, it's a narrative problem that we have in the way we tell our history. And I would also say that one thing that's distinctive about the U.S. Um, compared especially to European countries is that we have much less of a foundational commitment to equality um, in many aspects of life, but in particular, I'm thinking like domesticity, <laughs> marriage. So there's the, there is a sort of second shift globally, but it's worse in the US. So the fact that women do so much, at least compared to Europe, that women do so much more domestic labor um, and that that's been such a bind for women as, since the time women entered the paid workforce, that I think that also um, is a constraint on women seeking political office, right? Who has time to run for office when your mind is constantly like making your target list and preparing for soccer practice and making lunches? So those are two differences I would point to. Yeah, I would definitely say that there are some, some key differences. And I think we saw some of those differences on display Whenever, whenever Kamala Harris, whenever she was on the campaign trail, and it was she was having the debate, the VP debate with Mike Pence, and there were moments where you could tell nonverbally she wanted to say something, but she also was coached into do the smile, don't be mad, don't show anger, because if you show any kind of anger. She's going to get the angry black woman stereotype lumped onto her, even though I think anger is a wonderfully transformative and empowering rhetorical choice sometimes, as long as it moves the person forward. And I'm also thinking, for example, of like women in politics don't have the luxury to say, I'm only going to speak to one segment of the population. There's not one woman politician who said, going to talk to women because we all have something, the one thing in common, you know, versus if we have a white male candidate say, I'm only going to speak to my rich white guys over here. Everyone's just kind of like, 
okay, I guess that could work. You know, we see this, for example, with, with anger and moving it forward and saying, you know, I'm going to reclaim my time not to steal something from Maxine Waters, for example, but with Shirley Chisholm, where she's speaking to all a very diverse audience and men of all races are saying like, hey, you better slow your roll. And she says, no, my time is now. Not one male politician has ever had to justify, no, my time is now. They haven't had to justify or articulate themselves into those places and spaces. And then when you add on the double bind of gender plus race, there are multiple audiences that these women of color who are in politics are forced to navigate because of the foundation of racism and sexism within the political structure in the now United States. If no one else wants to um, jump in on that question, I'll, I'll move on to some others that have been posed. And this came up a, a little bit earlier on, but um, one of the questions is about the role of consumerism in women's political participation. So if anyone would like to share their thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I'll just go back to it because I raised it. Um, I didn't call it consumerism, but that's what it is. Uh, during the pre-revolutionary era, when women were enlisted to support these boycotts of consumer goods that were imported from Britain, and what I'd like to just emphasize there is it's a politicization of everyday life, a politicization of material goods. And I think what that does is allow women um, to participate in politics at that time, even without uh, being formally enfranchised or without stepping outside of their traditional roles as wives and mothers. And you know, I know that my colleagues who are eager for women to get the vote in the you know the late nineteenth and twentieth century would be frustrated by that. But I think this development is really significant because it it proves to both men and women that women can play a political role and that they can make contributions. And so I think that um, incrementally it was it was a really important step in the revolutionary era that consumerism, can the, the purchase or non-purchase of consumer goods became a political issue and um, empowered women and acknowledged um, women's contributions to political action. So it was a kind of political activism. Uh, I'm stepping a little bit outside of my expertise zone here. So this is more of a Nancy as common citizen comment rather than Nancy as any kind of expert comment. Uh, we were just having a, a, a conversation about women and consumerism in a different uh, context uh, last week. And so now I'm thinking of like women in the 1950s and 60s and when like the, the rise of like kitchen appliances and the woman as in charge of the domestic sphere as kind of a business, like the machines of the domestic sphere. And so I wasn't, I was thinking more of women as being consumed because women are generally consumed in the media. And so someone was explaining about how they're actually also portrayed as consumers. So I'm not talking about your uh, area in time, Rosemary. I'm thinking like more recently about how those ties between um, kind of women's voices and consumerism, I can totally see that. I, I, but also it seems complicated because at least in the 50s, 60s and into the 70s, that kind of consumerism was tied to keeping them in the home because the man was the one in the narrative, which isn't always true, but in the narrative they were selling, the man goes out to work, the woman's in charge of the home. So if the woman buys a new washing machine, it's with the man's money and it keeps her in the home doing her kind of thing. So there's like an interesting complexity there that I don't have the expertise to sort out. It's just, there's like, there's a lot going on with that great question from Matt. And I would add to what you just said, Nancy, with just as the ads are being targeted in the 50s and 60s to white women in the home where the homes were cleaned by black women. Mm. So you have the semblance of 
white women making the decisions. Maybe it's like, hey, neighbor, look what my husband got me, this washer and dryer, or I don't know, vacuum or whatever it might be. But the people as it's that the people who are attached to that prestige are black women who then give even a higher credibility for that woman. So it's this really racist and sexist narrative that spins out of how consumers are both purchasers and consumed. There's this incredible 1950s commercial for kitchen appliances that I show to my class sometimes and we will we it literally generates like 30 minutes of conversation from this two minute commercial so I think there's um a lot more that could be said there there's even a, a cartoon and I can't remember who did it and it might have been like 10 12 years ago and they show and it's it's from the enslaved the overt enslavery in the United States so somewhere in the 1800s and they show two white women in the general store and they're like picking up, looking at their clothes. And one woman looks at the tag and she says, oh, this is, this is organic, hand-picked by domestic slaves. So you see this wedding here of even as we, you know, it's, I mean, it's saying lots of things to how we look at organic food and we could go off on that too. But just in terms of the place and space of, women as well as being oppressors. And so oftentimes they're erased in these kinds of conversations because of that attachment to, they may not own property, but they're still, if, if we're talking about enslaved periods and post into the 1950s and 60s, they're still in charge of black people's bodies and black women's bodies in home spaces. I, I'd just like to say here too, that I think you know, most of us would like there to be a narrative of women's progress sort of beginning with the American Revolution and culminating in our present moment. Um, and also with African Americans from slavery to freedom. But, you know, the more you study history, the more you realize that these periods of what we see as progress or advancement or enlightenment are often fear followed by periods of backlash, of re regression in terms of the rights and privileges and possibilities enjoyed by women and Black people. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's really frustrating, but I think an awareness that we have to fight against the backlash is really critical because it's not, uh, it's not an arc toward the, the constant expansion of women's rights or rights for African Americans. It's uh, a little bit of progress and then maybe backsliding. And so it's, um, it's really, really frustrating. And to the point about, uh, you know, consumerism, I think, you know, in the fifth, 1950s, you're coming out of an era of the uh, Second World War where women enjoyed in, an incredibly broad range of, of economic opportunities. And then, you know, uh, the, the 50s were such a, a regression from the hope or expansion of their roles. So, but it, I mean, it's true, you know, look at what happened after the Civil War and, you know, then with uh, Reconstruction and Jim Crow. And so it's just, um, I think uh, Americans have to understand that their history does not proceed in a straight line and that without active pushback against the forces um, of re regression, if you want to put it that way, it, it will happen. I think that's a really good point, Rosemary, because then if you look at like post-World War I, post-World War II, you see that Black women, even if they wanted to be really active in different parts of feminist or womanist movements, their struggle really ceases over women's rights because they have to concentrate their energies on resisting racism. And so you're, they're, they're pulled even as we're women and people of color, but that binary thinking 
And in this case, in order to su simply survive racism, and the fight against racism is the one thing that gets put on top and distinguishes itself from quote unquote traditional white feminism to black feminism, Chicana studies movement, American Indian movement, woman, you know, womanism is that equal fight of and the conjoining of the twin oppressions of racism and sexism and fighting those equally. Yeah, um, one of the audience members, Janice Harris says that Isabel Wilkerson would say that caste keeps on reinserting itself. Um, I, I would put it slightly differently. I would say there's just this constant reshuffling of the hierarchies and that every time we claim or assert equality, there's still someone at the bottom. And, uh, you know, I think the people at the top have been pretty much on top the whole time, but there is a reshuffling of the hierarchy and there's not true equality. And there can be regression in terms of the rights and privileges enjoyed by those who are not at the top of this hierarchy. I just wanna give a quick shout out to the the, the gender complication that COVID has created in this sense, like the return of the searing domestic duties um, and, and how they've fallen, I think primarily on women, especially now that children are being educated in their homes. So just another iteration, like Rosemary was saying, um, that also falls on different shoulders with different weight as Dr. Patton was saying. Yeah, just to kind of um, continue addressing some of the audience's excellent questions. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to type it. Um, this question um, from Michelle Jarman, it says, if you look at Kamala Harris and the potential backlash related to her historic role, what woman in history would you have her draw upon to, uh, to open us up to new possibilities? So yeah, any thoughts on that? I think Shirley Chisholm, because, you know, or, or even Waters too, Maxine Waters. I'm thinking of Maxine Waters' statement where she said in one of her, one of her speeches to the, the human rights, what's the rest of that one, Nancy? Human rights. It was, it was only her speech, the only speech that we covered, but human rights initiative or, or, you know, whatever it was, but she said, I am, I am a strong black woman and I cannot be intimidated. I cannot be undermined. And I can see ripples of that, you know, because they're also colleagues. I wonder in my imagined conversation, like what Kamala Harris and, and Maxine Waters might say to one another, but you know, Kamala Harris might say, I'm a, I'm a strong, by a racial woman and I cannot be intimidated or undermined. I mean, I, I really see that fight within her and by fight, I mean like that power to move forward in the same way you see it, like with Stacey Abrams of, you're gonna tell me to take a seat? Well, Shirley Chisholm told me they don't bring you a, a seat you know, at the table, bring a folding chair. And these are the women who are gonna bring their folding chair and be like, I am here. And so I see them as being standing on each other's shoulders as well as propping up current and future generations. I love this question because it invites us to say the names of women that are less familiar to us or to many of us today. So I want to say a few more names. <laughs> um, and I want to call to mind Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, the <laughs> the women's rights leader and abolitionist who gave so many stirring speeches, including one from 1866, which you could Google after this, or if I have a chance, I'll put it in the chat, about how we are all bound up in this together, where she's really calling out white women for their abandonment of Black women in the struggle for civil rights, or with, at the time, voting rights after the Civil War. And I think what that I see is the through line of women's political advocacy is that it's always been black women leading the campaign for universal voting rights, that they are the ones who have said time and time again, citizenship should equal voting rights. And white women have said, oh, maybe 
I would like to vote, um, but I don't know if I care that you vote, right? But it's always been Black women. So I think there's a through line from Frances Ellen Watkins Harper to Stacey Abrams through the civil rights movement of saying, you know what? Are we a democracy or not? Does citizenship equal voting rights or not? So like Dr. Patton was saying earlier, the 19th Amendment is not a reality for women of color until the 1965 Civil Rights Act, which has been you know, pretty seriously dismantled by 2013 Supreme Court decision. So this, if there was one thing that I think that the like suffrage centennial, which is also the 150th of the 15th amendment should call us to action about, it's that citizenship should equal voting rights. What would it look like if all citizens really had access to the ballot in America? I think that would be a sea change for so many issues. Okay, yeah, if no one else wants to jump in on that one, I will um, uh, move on and sort of, I guess, thinking uh, that we have about 10 minutes left, but also kind of uh, with what you were saying, Dr. Hamlin, about like it invites us to like say the names of forgotten women. Um, one of our, when someone has asked, you know, who is, what is one of your favorite women in history to study? I'll kind of refine that a little bit more and say like, you know, what are some some women that we have not discussed or um, you know, women's movements that we haven't that we haven't yet talked about that you see as contributing, you know, lasting change in U.S. history or being particularly interesting or important. I'll um, volunteer someone who's actually not American. It's Mary Wollstonecraft, and uh, she was a British woman living in the 1790s who wrote um, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, published in 1792. And it was a bestseller. It was a bestseller in, in Britain and in the United States. And it really introduced that concept of women's rights into popular circulation. And uh, really, it, it, there was not one well understood definition of what women's rights was at this time. Most often it referred to allowing women to get an equal education with men to, you know, the argument that women had the same mental capacity as, as men. But I think that um, she got the conversation started and she really, um, she, she was in her own life an amazing person. Um, <laughs> uh, Professor Hamlin, she was the original free love advocate, had a couple of children uh, when she wasn't married, and, um, and her daughter was actually scarred by the experience, I guess. She became uh, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, but I think Mary Wollstonecraft had an incredible um, an incredibly profound impact on the debate over women's rights in Britain and America in the 1790s that, as I say, got the conversation going. And, you know, you can't point to concrete uh, immediate changes, but I, I do think that her, her name should be more well known than it is. I could play this fun game all day. How yeah. long? Have <laughs> um, a few names. I want to make sure that we um, bring to the forefront. Uh, Polly Murray is often my number one, I think, recommendation of a woman we should know a lot more about. So she was RBG before RBG, right? She paved the way for the legal strategy that both made that both made Brown versus Board of Education possible, and which so many important civil rights decisions drew on, and also the first uh, women's rights cases argued by Ruth Bader Ginsburg were pioneered by um, legal scholar Polly Murray. Who, uh, so, so there's some great books that have recently come out about her. I would put her at the top of my list. I also would love for us to talk uh, more about Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president in 1872, another free lover. Um, so um, she spent the election night of 1872 in a New York City jail because she had the nerve to write about the affair that Henry Ward Beecher, the most popular man, a minister in America was having. 
Uh, she was really incensed by the double standard. Now people were talking about her free love ideals where everyone knew this famous minister was having an affair with one of her parishioners. So she wrote about it and then spent election night in jail. So again, this link between bodily autonomy, political autonomy, the sexual double standard propelling women um, into politics, I think is another important reminder. Dr. Patton, you go next, because I'm going to answer, but I'm going to transgress. I feel like I'm set up a little bit here. <laughs> so I would say I, I can't pick one. I've named some of the people, but I pick issues. Since I, I as a rhetorician, I'm more concerned with the speeches and how the speeches or the poems or the social justice protests move people through. And so that's what I'm really inspired by. And, and I like to see the connections because even though Rosemary you know, aptly pointed out that there's no direct line from we were horrible and now we're just these liberal minded progressive people. That's just simply not true as she said, but I really like looking at the line from who were the risk takers whose voices were recorded in antiquity to today and how those bear out today. And I like to make links to what's happening in Black Lives Matters or the Me Too movement also started by black women, but that just kind of got lost with that Hollywood shuffle of co-opting black women's spaces and voices and creation as well. But I like to look to see where those threads are and how they're the same and what progression have we made and what what regressions have we made and so I was really inspired by the protests with George Floyd's murder because it became a worldwide civil rights protest where I've spent half my life growing up in Germany I speak fluent German I'm first generation American on one side of my family and to see wide places where there's small numbers of black people around the globe also protesting. I, I immediately connect those to some of our early retros. So I can't really pick one person, but I pick like, wow, look at the great things that were going on in Haiti at the same time, it freaked France out. And that's where my thinking is rather than one particular person, but I really like these current social justice movements because they are honoring the past. And it's oftentimes the past that we forget, both the mistakes that were made in the past, but, uh, but also and how they correct them now so that their movements can live and go forward. So that's my answer. So I have a tons of respect for these um, writers who deserve to be uh, recorded and recuperated and represented in the kinds of things that we study and the kinds of things that are written. But what I study for, for my scholarship is everyday people, everyday women and the stories that they tell. So I'm gonna transgress by saying that some of the names I'd like to throw out there um, actually dip into people that are just everyday folks. So I'd like to give a shout out to people who think, who help, who I think contribute to long lasting change through their writing. This includes everything from books to blogs. Um, by sharing their stories and reflections. So particularly here, I'm thinking of Ijeomo Uluo, who wrote, So You Want to Talk About Race, and Hannah Nicole Jones and the crew behind the 1619 Project, which completely revised, helped me see a new perspective on how to even conceive of the places that I live. But even on social media, I have a friend um, and colleague named Dr. Christina Cedillo, who posts about her identity as a multiracial, but also Latina woman who is disabled and works in academia. And she teaches me so much about how to make change from like just everyday women's spaces. Um, I wanna give some shout out to teachers who have to address these questions of inequity head on and who have to give their students the vocabulary and the tools to pursue challenging conversations about power and belonging because if we can't talk about these things in civil ways, then we're never gonna get anywhere. It's gonna just be a constant circle instead of a spiral or any kind of progress. So I wanna give a little shout out to two of my current grad students, um, Christina Falero and Stephen Mack. Stephen identifies as a guy, so he doesn't technically fit into women making a difference, but he's writing about gender. He's writing about toxic masculinity and how to unpack that in the classroom. And gender is always in relation. All identities are always in relation to something else. And so we can't just like pick gender out and not think about like race, not think about class, 
not think about the masculine side of, of questions in addition to the feminine side. So I want to give a shout out to them, as well as Dr. Patton, and she doesn't know I'm going to say this, so she can get mad at me later, because she does like international service projects in her classes, and that's making, that's a woman making a change in the world. Last little shout out is to community leaders from our school campuses to city councils, nonprofits churches, service organizations. Um, I'm thinking that these people on the ground know that what actual inequity and injustice look like. And they do that grassroots work of implementing procedures, implementing programs that actually make the change. And a little shout out to my friend, Angie Bates in Franklin, Texas, who does this work herself. And it just seems to me like such a life mission, not to romanticize it, it's hard. So I love the women in the political limelight, but I think there's also this amazing kind of grassroots level of people who are making change. So thanks for letting me transgress. You know, transgress away. I, I kind of love, and this will probably be the note we end on as our time uh, draws near, but I love this idea um, of, of also thinking about just ordinary everyday people who, ordinary people doing extraordinary things, right? And particularly those of you and everyone in our audience, but particularly, you know, I know there's a lot of students out there as well. The, the idea that really anyone can help uh, change things and, and work to make things better in their community. Um, on that note, I will just thank all of our panelists again for a really amazing conversation. And thank you to the audience for joining us. I'll also give a plug, um, this kind of second half of our um, Women's History Month series for the Think and Drinks is two weeks from, from today. Same link, we'll all be here hanging out again. Uh, well, I will be anyways. And that one is gonna be on women at work. So it's gonna look at the, the history of women in, the, in uh, labor. And we'll actually touch upon a few of the things that we have started to get around here, ranging from you know domestic duties and, and COVID-19 and all these things. So um, stay tuned for that. And we would love to have you join us. So yeah, thanks so much to all of you. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great to talk to you all and thank you all for listening. Bye. And Apollo, there were some questions that we, we kind of touched upon part of them, so I didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, thanks for those of you who, who posed questions as well. <laughs>